Life as a hotel manager is never just about reservations and room service. It's about keeping cool when everything else is a mess. I'm Kimberly, and at 32, I've seen my fair share of high-maintenance guests, but this guy was different. Decked out in a suit that screamed more dollars than cents and fiddling with his high-end phone, he seemed like just another rich guy until he had a complaint. His room wasn't cleaned right. He came down fuming, ready to unleash on anyone in sight. That's when I stepped in, saying, Sir, I understand you're upset. Let me handle this for you. My voice was calm and practiced. He looked taken aback, maybe because I didn't start apologizing left and right. I fixed his issue quickly, got someone up there with fresh towels and an apology. When he came back to the lobby, his anger had cooled off. You handle things well, he commented, a slight nod showing his approval. Thanks, we aim to please, I shot back with a smile. That's when we really started talking. His name was Tom, and he wasn't just some businessman. He was a cryptocurrency investor. The next day, after his city tour, he surprised me by showing up at the front desk with a small bouquet of flowers for handling the chaos yesterday. I laughed, taking them. You trying to make me blush or something? Maybe, he smirked, charming enough. It became a thing. Every morning for the next few days, I'd find a new bouquet at the desk. Small, nothing fancy, but nice. Then just like that, he checked out, suitcase in hand, cool as ever. But before he left, he asked for my number. I gave it to him, not thinking much of it, but then I missed him. Missed our little chats and his daily flowers. A few days later, my phone rang. Hey, Kimberly, how about dinner? I owe you for the great service, and the flowers don't seem to be enough. I was surprised at how fast my heart raced. Sure, Tom, dinner sounds great. Fantastic. I'll pick you up at eight. As I hung up and stared at my phone, I wondered what I was getting into. Yet, I was looking forward to seeing him again. Was this just a simple dinner or something more? Either way, I was about to find out. Tom picked me up right at eight. He wasn't driving anything flashy. Just a decent car that didn't scream. I'm bloated. The restaurant was cozy, tucked away on a side street I'd passed a million times but never noticed. As we settled in, Tom waved off the menu, saying, let's just go with the chef's specials. Trust me. Life's too short for boring food, Kimberly. Dinner started with light chatter, but as the platters came and the wine flowed, things got deeper. So Kimberly, tell me something. What's it like managing a whole hotel by yourself? I admitted, it's hectic, chaotic. Sometimes it feels like I'm more of a therapist than a manager. He nodded, taking a sip of his wine, saying it must be rewarding. It is, but enough about me. What about you? Traveling around, investing in cryptos sounds like a gamble. He laughed. It's a calculated risk, Kimberly, but yeah, it's a gamble. Made some, lost some, but mostly I'm in the green. I raised an eyebrow, sensing he was talking about more than just money. Then he shifted the conversation to family. You got anyone besides your sister? The question caught me off guard. Family was a touchy subject. It's just Sarah and me. Our parents passed away when I was 22. Tom's face softened. The conversation flowed naturally after that, with him sharing about his strained family relationships and why he preferred being on the road. Less drama. Dinner ended with us laughing over dessert. As he drove me home, I told him I really enjoyed the night. He smiled that slow, easy smile that seemed to light up his whole face. So how about we do this again? Say Friday? I didn't hesitate. Yeah, I'd like that. As I got out of the car, I realized I was smiling too. It felt good, easy, 
like I might be getting into something special. A month zipped by, and before I knew it, Tom and I were engaged. It sounds nuts, I know, but when you're floating on cloud nine, you don't really notice how fast you're moving. Tom moved into my apartment shortly after he popped the question one night, while we were sprawled on the couch with takeout boxes between us. He said, Kimberly, I've been thinking we should do something big for our wedding. You deserve a day as gorgeous as you are. I laughed, nearly spitting out some fried rice. Big, huh? What are you thinking? He was serious, suggesting a real celebration. You put in $50,000 for the wedding, and I'll handle the honeymoon. Top notch, the fanciest hotel in the world. After that, I'll buy us a house. I was too much in love and caught up in the fantasy to flinch. All right, let's do it, I said. And just like that, I agreed to drain my savings for one spectacular day. So the planning started. I handed over my savings, and Tom took charge of the arrangements, all about making it lavish. It's going to be perfect, Kimberly. Just you wait. One afternoon, I introduced him to my sister, Sarah. We caught up with her at the local diner, where she slings hash. Tom's charm didn't miss a beat. This is the famous sister I've heard so much about. Well, you're just as beautiful as Kimberly, he told her, flashing that million-dollar smile. Sarah blushed and fussed with her apron. Thanks. Kimberly's told me a lot about you, too. All good things, of course. I watched them, feeling a mix of pride and something else. Nervousness, jealousy. I couldn't put my finger on it. Sarah and I were close, real close, but seeing her with Tom, laughing at his jokes a little too heartily, formed a weird knot in my stomach. Hey, I'm going to grab us some coffees. Back in a gif, Tom said, heading off to the counter, leaving Sarah and me at the booth. You like him, huh? Sarah nudged me, her voice low. I do. It's all happening fast, but it feels right, I admitted, trying to convince myself as much as her. The rest of our visit was light, but Tom's words about the wedding and his compliment to Sarah kept replaying in my mind. The weeks leading up to the wedding were a blur of color swatches, cake tastings, and endless lists. Tom had thrown himself into the plans with an enthusiasm that was both admirable and, frankly, a bit alarming. But as the big day crept closer, my excitement was tinged with nerves, not about marrying Tom, but about everything going off without a hitch. One sunny afternoon, I found myself in the bridal boutique, standing on a pedestal surrounded by mirrors. The shop assistant was fluffing the train of a gown I was trying on. It was beautiful, sure, but did it feel like the one? I wasn't certain. You look stunning, Kim. That has to be the dress. Linda, my ever-enthusiastic best friend, gushed from her seat in the corner of the fitting room. I turned this way examining the lace detailing. I don't know, maybe it's too much. I don't want to look like a cupcake. Just then, laughter echoed from the next booth over, familiar laughter. I peeked around the curtain, and there was Sarah stepping onto a pedestal in a bridal gown herself. She looked, well, she looked like a bride. Sarah, what in the world are you doing in a wedding dress? I stammered, my voice echoing my confusion and surprise. She whirled around, her eyes wide as she spotted me. Oh, Kim, it's not what it looks like. I was just trying it on for fun, you know, seeing what it feels like. For fun, I repeated, my brain trying to make sense of the scene. Yeah, you know, just a bit of pretend. I mean, when else am I going to wear something like this? She laughed, but it was strained and she avoided my eyes. We left the boutique with my dress still undecided, and the image of Sarah in that gown haunted me all the way home. At dinner, Tom noticed my quiet mood. Something on your mind, babe? 
he asked, passing me the salt. I shook my head, poking at my food. It's nothing, just wet and jitters, I guess. Later that night, I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling. Sarah trying on that wedding dress for fun didn't sit right with me. It felt off, like a puzzle piece that doesn't quite fit no matter how you turn it. But what was I supposed to do? Accuse my sister of something based on a hunch? The next day, I dropped by the diner to see Sarah. She was wiping down tables, her back to me as I approached. Hey, sis, I greeted her, my voice casual. She turned, a smile instantly lighting up her face. Kim, what brings you here? More wedding planning chaos? Something like that, I said, leaning on the counter. Actually, I wanted to ask you about yesterday, the whole trying on a wedding dress thing. It was really just for fun. Sarah's smile faltered just for a second before she recovered. Yeah, of course. What else would it be? I studied her face, looking for the little sister I knew so well. Just checking. You tell me if there was more to it, right? Of course, she replied quickly, too quickly. Don't worry about me, Kim. I'm just happy for you, really. As I walked out of the diner, the unease settled deeper in my chest. Something was going on. I could feel it. But digging for truths that might shake everything upright before my wedding seemed like a gamble. Was I ready to roll those dice? Not yet, I decided. Not yet. It was just another hectic morning. Tom rushing out as usual for his meetings. But today, he left something behind. His phone. It was buzzing nonstop on the kitchen table, lighting up with notification after notification. Curiosity gnawed at me. It was like the universe itself was prompting me to take a peek. Thank goodness there was no password, odd for someone so immersed in the tech world. Tom always said he had nothing to hide. I picked up the phone, and the screen lit up with a message from a number not saved, but all too familiar. Can't wait to see you later. Yesterday was amazing. It was the last message sent late last night, and there was a reply from Tom. Me too. I hate hiding like this, but soon we won't have to. My hands trembled. This wasn't happening. There must be some explanation. I scrolled through their earlier messages, each one like a punch in the gut. The affectionate nicknames, the plans, the inside jokes. And then I saw a selfie of him, in with my sister Sarah, laughing at some cafe I'd been to a hundred times with both of them. My heart sank as I scrolled through messages of them plotting behind my back. Sarah, my own sister, was pregnant with his child. They were planning to kick me out of my own wedding, and she was going to take my place at the altar. Their words cut deep. They mocked me, called me a fool, a knave cash cow laughing at how they'd use my money to fund their wedding. Betrayal twisted in my gut like a knife. After everything I did for Sarah, after our parents died, this was how she repaid me. Anger boiled inside, but cold calculation took over. Revenge sparked in my mind, clear and sharp, but I needed to play it cool, keep the upper hand. I wiped the tears from my face, took a few deep breaths, and steeled myself. When Tom walked back in an hour later, I was ready. Foam in hand, smile plastered on my face. Oh, you forgot this, I said, holding out his phone as if it was just another forgetful morning. Tom looked relieved as he took his phone. Thanks, babe. Thought I'd lost it for good. You didn't look through it, did you? He tried to joke a nervous edge to his laugh. Why would I? Trust is key, right? Right? I kept my voice light, betraying nothing of the storm raging inside me. Right? Tom echoed, a flicker of something passing through his eyes. Guilt, maybe. He kissed me on the forehead, a gesture meant to reassure. I'll see you tonight. Love you. 
I forced a smile, the words tasting bitter. Love you too. As soon as the door shut behind him, my act crumbled. Alone, I let the facade fall away, but not the resolve. They thought they could play me for a fool, use me, and toss me aside. No, I was going to turn their deceit back on them. They wouldn't know what hit them until it was too late. The wedding day dawned bright and clear, the kind of day you picture in a fairy tale. Only I knew today's tale was more grim than charming. As I stood there beside Tom, dressed in my immaculate wedding gown, every guest in the venue whispered about how perfect we looked together. Little did they know the drama that was about to unfold. Just as we were about to exchange vows, a commotion at the back caught everyone's attention. It was Sarah, my sister, in a wedding dress, breathless, as if she'd run the whole way. She didn't even pause as she pushed past the guests, straight up to us. Sorry I'm late, but I couldn't let you do this without telling you the truth. I deserve to be here more than she does. Sarah announced, glaring at me before turning to Tom with a desperate kind of triumph in her eyes. Tell them, Tom. Tell them about us and our baby. Tom chuckled, a sound that echoed mockingly in the hushed venue. He looked at me, his smirk cruel. Thanks, Kimberly, for putting together such a gorgeous wedding. It's everything we wanted. The guests gasped, their murmurs turning into a loud buzz of disbelief. I kept my smile practiced and serene as I stepped back. Oh, I don't mind being a guest at the spectacle. Tom and Sarah exchanged confused glances, clearly not expecting my calm demeanor. Their moment of victory was short-lived, however, as another guest made her dramatic entrance. An older woman, furious, her eyes zeroing in on Tom. I hope you're enjoying your wedding, you lying cheat. She yelled as she marched up the aisle. Tom's face turned a shade paler, his eyes wide with shock. Melissa, what are you doing here? I'm his wife, that's what. Melissa declared, facing the crowd, who were now on their feet, their shock palpable. And the mother of his daughter, who he hasn't supported in months. Sarah stumbled backward, her face ashen, her dream wedding turning into a nightmare. She looked at me, then at Tom, her expression crumpling. I stepped forward, my voice loud and clear for everyone to hear. I hired a private detective when I first got suspicious. Turns out our dear groom here isn't just a cheater. He's a con artist. His investments are all failures, his debts astronomical, and yes, he's very much married with a child he's neglected. The silence that followed was heavy, broken only by Melissa's sobs and Sarah's quiet whimpers. Tom tried to speak, tried to explain, but the looks of disgust from the guests and the utter betrayal in Sarah's eyes left him stuttering into silence. I turned to address everyone, my voice steady despite the chaos. I loved him, and I trusted him like a fool, but today I'm reclaiming my life. This wedding, this farce, is his making. Let him face the consequences. After that, chaos erupted fully. Melissa was demanding answers, guests were shouting questions, and Sarah was crying, realizing too late the depth of Tom's deceit. The wreckage of the wedding day was bad enough, but the surprises weren't over yet. Right after Melissa made her entrance and aired out all of Tom's dirty laundry, another pair stormed in, Tom's own parents, who looked like they'd been through a hurricane of disappointment. The place fell silent as Tom's father took the stage, his voice booming and filled with a bitter anger that echoed off the walls. I just learned about the despicable acts my son has committed. He bellowed, every word dripping with disdain. Not only has he deceived Kimberly here, trying to humiliate her in front of us all, but he's also been hiding his marriage to a wealthy woman, Melissa, whom he left stranded. Tom tried to speak, his voice barely a whisper compared to the thunderous accusations of his father. Dad. His father cut him off. 
You've shamed us enough. Your mother and I can't believe the son we raised could do such things. His look of disappointment was piercing, even to me. His mother, a stern woman who had been silently observing the chaos, finally spoke up, her voice sharp and cold. We are ashamed of you, Tom, and as of today, you are no longer part of our family or our will. You've shown your true colors, and we want no part in this deceit. The room spun with murmurs and whispers, everyone piecing together the spectacle. Meanwhile, Tom looked like he was shrinking, his face pale, his usual charm nowhere in sight. The next day, I met with a lawyer and filed a lawsuit against him for the $50,000 I had invested in what was supposed to be our wedding. The court didn't take long to see through his lies, especially with all the evidence stacked against him, and they ruled in my favor. Tom was ordered to pay back every penny. Melissa wasn't about to let him off easy either. She filed her own lawsuit, demanding not just the return of her investments but alimony for their daughter, whom Tom had barely acknowledged. The last I heard, Melissa was on a warpath to ensure Tom paid for every bit of distress and abandonment. Seeing Tom brought down by his own actions, forced to face the consequences, gave me a bitter kind of satisfaction. I was out $50,000, but getting it back felt like reclaiming my dignity and some semblance of control over my life. Life after the chaos of what was supposed to be my wedding day settled into a quiet routine much faster than I expected. My ex fiance Tom left town right after the disastrous ceremony and the illegal aftermath, leaving behind a trail of broken promises and one very pregnant, very alone sister, Sara. The days turned into weeks, and as I threw myself into hobbies and met up with friends like Linda, I found a kind of solace that had been missing in the whirlwind of my engagement to Tom. Pottery classes, long evening walks, and Friday nights out helped stitch back some of the normalcy into my life. One chilly afternoon, while I was at the park sketching the bare trees against the winter sky, my phone buzzed. It was Sarah. She had tried reaching out a few times since everything went down, but I wasn't ready to hear her out. This time was no different, but I answered anyway, more out of reflex than desire. Kimberly, can we talk? Sarah's voice was soft, almost a whisper, and I could hear the strain behind it. I'm listening, I said, keeping my tone neutral, my fingers tightening around my sketch pad. I, I know I messed up. More than messed up. I'm sorry doesn't even cover it, but I am. I'm sorry, Kimberly, and I need help, she admitted, her voice cracking with emotion. You are not the first to go through this, and you won't be the last, I replied, the coldness in my own voice surprising even me. You'll figure it out, Sarah. You have to. There was a pause, heavy and filled with things unsaid, things that might never be repaired. If that's how you feel, I understand. I hope one day you can forgive me, she finally said. As I picked up my sketch pad and focused back on the stark lines of the winter trees, I realized that moving on wasn't just about filling my days with activities. It was also about accepting the hard truths of betrayal and learning to trust my judgment again. Life went on with coffee dates with Linda, where we talked about everything except Tom and Sarah. Pottery classes, where my hands molded new creations symbolizing a new start and quiet evenings spent in the peace of my own company. Through it all, I rebuilt a life that was solely mine, no longer overshadowed by the deceit of those I loved.